So, and I was like, I know. I was like, I saw everything with the issue. I was like, I don't have to say, 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 I don't have to say,
So some of them are expressing the slow variant, some are expressing the fast variant. Okay. Um, so in normal phenotypically or uh, chromosomally normally normal females, we would expect two X chromosomes. One of them is going to be smushed down into a bar body, dressed into a bar body in each of the cells. So we get one bar body because we have one extra chromosome. Males have one X and one Y, okay? So they don't form bar bodies because they only have one copy of all of those X chromosome genes. Okay, so they have no bar bodies. In individuals that have an X chromosome and no other sex chromosomes, Okay, so this is, would be, this would result from an error in meiosis, where we get one gamete that has no sex chromosomes and then one gamete that contributes an X chromosome. This does not cause um, death or anything like that. It just causes a disorder to occur. Um, again, no bar bodies because each cell only gets one X chromosome. For individuals that have three X chromosomes, We'll talk about how that happens eventually. Um, two of these X's are actually going to be inactivated. So we would see two bar bodies in the cell. Not just one, but two. Right? So we only have one functional X chromosome. And individuals that are XXY, phenotypically male, have one bar body because, again, one of these X chromosomes is going to be So in a cell, we should only ever have one X chromosome that is active. You could have six X chromosomes, five of them would form bar bodies, one would be active. Alright, so we are now going to move into looking at non-simple dominant recessive relationships. So at this point, we've only talked about what we call complete dominance. So in complete dominance, uh, if you have a dominant allele, okay, so here we have a dominant allele that creates red flower coloration in the heterozygote, that individual is red. That's complete dominance. The only allele that's shown is the dominant allele, so we gain one allele. <coughs> Um, we then, we do have other types of dominance, so the two we'll look at are incomplete and co-dominance. Incomplete dominance is going to be a mid-phenotype when we're looking at the heterozygote. Co-dominance is going to be a heterozygote that shows both alleles. Alright, so when we're talking about dominant relationships, we always want to look at what's happening in the heterozygote. Right. Our homozygote dominant and our homozygote recessive are always going to show the phenotypes of the alleles that they carry. We don't get any information from them. Right. So if I just showed you two flowers, and one is red and one is white, and I say these are both homozygote individuals, can you tell me which one is dominant or which one is recessive? No. So we always have to look at that heterozygote state to determine if it's a simple dominance incomplete dominance or co-dominance relationship. So if you are ever defining these terms, you should always define them in terms of what the heterozygote looks like. Okay, so complete dominance, we've already talked about our heterozygotes are gonna have whatever that wild type phenotype is. The reason that we see complete dominance. So if we have uh, a wild type allele and a recessive allele or a mutant allele, and the wild type allele is dominant over the recessive or mutant allele, one potential for what's going on in the individual themselves is that that one normal copy is enough to produce about 50% of the normal protein levels which is enough to show the dominant phenotype. Okay. So this is showing phenotypes across the bottom, two purple and white. We have genotype across the top. Remember that genotypes determine phenotypes. Right? 
right? Because the genotype is going to determine what in a cell. We've talked about this at least three times. Your DNA sequence, which is your genotype, determines, yeah, protein that's present in a cell. So if you have two big P alleles, that means you have two alleles that are coding for purple coloration. You are making 100% of the possible protein that causes purple, purple plants. If you have one big P allele, that's your wild type. Here the little P allele is a mutant, so it's a what we call a loss of function allele. It doesn't produce any color. But because you have one big P allele, you're still producing 50%, right? Because you have half of the genetic information that codes for that protein. So you make about 50% of the protein for this particular phenotype. In this case, it's still enough to produce a purple color. Two little P alleles, you don't make any of the protein that results in purple coloration. So you are now a colorless or a white flower. So this is one possibility where even just having 50% of the functional protein or the normal protein is enough to give you that phenotype. That's not always the case. So sometimes a heterozygote produces more than that 50%. When that happens, it's because um, that gene, so this big P gene or allele, is actually upregulated during the transcription and translation process, which means that we actually make more copies of it than we normally would and produce more than 50% of the protein. Okay, so sometimes the cells can tell that there's a non-functional copy, and so they make this one do more work to sort of make up or pick up that slack. And so that's going to help sort of compensate for having a loss of functional deal. All right, how many people get incomplete dominance and co-dominance confused all the time? Okay, I think more people than that probably do. Um, okay, so we'll talk through these two. Um, incomplete dominance, again, when we're looking at the heterozygote, it's going to fall between the dominant and the recessive. So do we have a true dominant-recessive relationship anymore? Maybe we should refer to that as that. They're going to fall between, the phenotype of the heterozygote is going to fall between the phenotypes of our homozygote and okay. So, here's an example. The, floor, the flower and the four o'clock plant. Has anybody seen, I think my grandmother had, it wasn't a four o'clock plant, but I want to say, it was like, I don't know, it was in the evening. But the flowers literally bloom at one time, every day, and then they close back up. Anybody seen those? So cool. I used to, maybe I was just a really weird kid. I used to go outside and stand there and watch them. They'd open every day and then close their house. I probably just don't want to be in my grandma's house anymore. Alright. So um, yeah, so our four o'clock plant, right? We have one allele, which is our CR allele, which causes red coloration. We have if we have two of them. So if we have a homozygote for the CR allele. We get a red flower. If we have CW alleles, homozygote for those, we get a white flower. When we cross these individuals, so our parental generation is a red flower and a white flower, the offspring, what would we expect the offspring if we had a simple dominant recessive relationship? What would they look like in the F1? Right, we would expect them to all be one or the other, so generally when we have bright colors like that, we are dominant, so we'd expect them all to be. Uh, in this case, the F1 generation is all pink. Okay. Alright, so what is our F2 generation going to look like? Yeah, so phenotypically, our F1 now actually matches our genotypic ratios. Okay. So we can do our kind of square. Alright, so we now have 
One red, two pink, and one white. Okay, so if I told you, without telling you that this was an incomplete dominant system, and I told you to do this cross, you would expect a three to one ratio, we get a one to two to one ratio. Okay, so. Um, so if you were to do the chi-square, I don't even think you really could do chi-square because you have two ex Yeah, I wouldn't ask you to do that. Well, because you would have two numbers for expected outcomes and three numbers for actual outcomes. Yeah? So you'd have to put a zero in there somewhere? Uh, don't study that, I wouldn't ask you to do that. Okay. Um, so in this case, in our F1 generation, What's happening is this CR allele, or this CR allele down here, is still producing 50% of the protein that makes the flower red, but in this case, 50% is not enough to make it actually red. So we get sort of a washed out coloration. Boom. All right, the reason we get incomplete dominance um, is because sometimes at a macro level, so when you're just looking at something, there is enough of the protein to, again, give us that phenotype. If we actually looked at things in the micro level, we would probably notice that it's not the same, a heterozygote isn't the same as the homozygote dominant. So you guys looked at um, those corn kernels the other day, right? And some were like big and puffy and some were shrunken in. If we had examined them under a microscope, we may have seen something like this, where sort of those big puffy ones had lots of this protein that make them swollen. The heterozygote still have enough to give us that outward appearance, but if we look, we actually see that there's less of that protein that causes the swelling. When we look at a homozygote recessive, we get kind of that super wrinkled look because it just doesn't have any. So this is all level-based, right? we look at it with our eyes versus a microscope versus a super microscope. We would see different things at each level. All right, good on incomplete dominance. It's incomplete because it's in between. All right, so we're gonna look at codominance and we've, got, we've actually already discussed or gone through codominance when you were looking at the sickle cell anemia. You looked at it in actually two ways. So we looked at it with blood types, and you looked at it with what we call overdominance, which is when heterozygotes have a selective advantage. So in this case, um, with sickle cell anemia, when we have heterozygote individuals, they have an increased fitness, so an increased chance of reproduction and survival under certain environmental circumstances. Right? So here is a normal red blood cell, this is what a sickled red blood cell looks like, so in somebody who has sickle cell anemia. This red blood cell does not carry oxygen well. Part of the reason that red blood cells are shaped like that is because it gives us a lot of surface area for the hemoglobin in the red blood cell to bind those oxygen molecules. This does not. And also this is a very fragile blood cell, so it's very easily destroyed, which means that we don't make enough red blood cells to even carry oxygen most of the time. Um, so if we have an individual that has two big A alleles, they are unaffected, okay, so they have all normal red blood cells, I would wager that most people in this room would be this genotype. If you have two S alleles, you have sickle cell, okay, so all of your red blood cells look like this. If you have a big A allele and a big S allele, you have some of both. Okay. Fortunately, these individuals have enough normal blood cells that they can carry oxygen under most conditions without too much trouble. There are quite a few athletes in the United States that have the trait for sickle cell. Right? So if you watch football games when teams travel to Colorado, sometimes they bench players. Those players are usually because they have the sickle cell trait. So in low oxygen conditions like high elevations, you don't want them out playing football because they might 
not be able to breathe super well, right? Um, that's in that this particular trait isn't really good in our area because they're okay most of the time. They don't breathe well at high altitudes or under low oxygen conditions, um, and we also don't have malaria. Right? The United States is not known as being sort of a malarial area. If those individuals lived in an area where malaria was an issue, so like in Panama or in Sub-Saharan Africa, then they actually have a higher fitness because they also are resistant to malaria where nobody else is. Okay. So in this case, again, if we compare the heterozygote to either of our homozygote individuals, they have an advantage. So we call this particular type of codominance, this is also called heterozygous advantage or overdominance. But, um, I'm going to kind of go through this. Da, da, da. I guess I don't have. No. Um, the other really common example is our blood types. All right, so we have, we have what we call an ABO system. Right? And there are actually four blood types that somebody can be. You can be A, you can be oops, A, B, B, or O. There are three alleles that control whether you're A, B, A, B, or O. And those alleles are IA, IB, and IO. What are the relationships between these alleles? I have some interesting things going on. Uh, IA is dominant? Or to what? To uh, IO. Yes. So we would say that A is completely dominant to IO. So if you have an A blood type, you can either be homozygous dominant or that, a heterozygote with an O. <coughs> Melissa, do you have another one? Yeah. IB is dominant to IO. Yep. IB is dominant to IO. Right, so you can be big, uh, big IB, big IB, or big IB, IO. Either way, you're type B. All right, now what is the relationship between big A and big B? Co-dominant. Yes. So we have big A co-dominant co to IB, which gives us our AB blood type. Then how are you O? If you're two I O. Yeah. So if you're O, you would be this. Okay. So in the blood typing system, we have two different types of relationships. We have a simple or complete dominance relationship between A and O and B and O, but then A and B are co-dominant. What this means. Is, without getting too much into the physiology piece of it. If you have type A blood, here's your red blood cell, you have antigens, which are proteins on the surface, that are A specific. So they're like little flags with A's on them. Okay. If you have type B blood, you have type B antigens, so your little flags have Bs all over them. If you are a B, you have both A and B antigens. Right? You express completely, you completely express both A and B traits. If you're type O over here, you have no antigens. 
We can also use blood type to sort of dispel this idea that the dominant alleles are the most common alleles. So what is the most common blood type in the United States? Oh, oh. negative. Or still positive. Oh. Yeah, O negative is your universal donor, but just the O blood type is the most common blood type. It's recessive, but it doesn't mean that it's disadvantageous or it doesn't get passed from generation to generation, right? So even though something's recessive, it doesn't make it like All right, so the difference between incomplete dominance and codominance is what? Codominance shows both and incomplete shows the entropy. Yes. So in a codominant, wow, you guys didn't spell it. I think I spelled it that bad. Codominance. Nope. I didn't even know. Codominance. Wow. Codominance. When we have codominancy, um, we have complete expression of both traits. So we have complete A antigens and complete B antigens here. In uh, incomplete dominance, we have an intermediate. So in this case, I don't even know what an intermediate antigen would look like. Like half of each in one. Cut a flag in half and then sew it together with another flag. I'm not sure. Um, but incomplete dominance is easy to visualize when we talk about coloration. Okay. Um, along these ideas, we have incomplete penetrance. So incomplete penetrance is going to be when we have a dominant allele that isn't always expressed, or isn't always expressed completely.
have the trait or the phenotype that we would expect with that dominant allele, that's, we can calculate penetrance. Okay, so I already calculated it for you, but 90% of the time, the allele causes the phenotype. So, I'm trying to think of an example of how I could. Let's say we had 50 heterozygote individuals, or 50 individuals carrying a dominant allele, and 25 of them showed a trait. What would be the tendency? 50%. So, 50% of the time, Somebody with that particular allele shows the phenotype that we would expect. Okay. Um, this is another sort of very relevant example right now. Right, There's a lot of talk about sort of breast cancer and um, breast cancer genes. And the most common breast cancer genes are BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, when we look at the BRCA gene and how it's inherited, it's usually going to be evident that you have a long family history of breast and ovarian cancer. So in this uh, tree, people who are tealish are affected with cancer. People that are pink have the allele, so they have the BRCA gene that is usually linked to breast cancer. And then people who are yellowish are non-carriers. So you can see that we have individuals in teal who have or who are affected. We also have individuals that have that same mutation that aren't affected. Okay, so just because an individual has a particular allele doesn't mean that they always show the phenotype that comes out at the end. Right? Some people, it's a 92-year-old woman, has never been affected by breast or ovarian cancer. Another individual in her sister, yes, sister, did have breast cancer and eventually I don't know what she had, but was diagnosed with breast cancer at a young age. So that this is a good example of where penetrance is important. All right. So kind of going hand in hand with penetrance is expressivity. Um, and expressivity tells us sort of the degree to which a particular trait is expressed. So if we go back to our polydactyly idea, you may know, or you may have noticed in some of the pictures that I showed, that the number of extra digits, or the number of extra fingers or toes, and the degree to which they are formed varies quite a bit. So, for example, this individual has six toes. They look like six normal toes. Right? You probably would not even really look twice if you saw this person walking around. But other people, like here, this is not a completely formed finger. Okay, it's kind of like more, not a skin tag, it looks like it has a bone, but it's not, it doesn't look just like another thumb sort of stuck out right now. Okay, so those are varying degrees of expressivity. Um, and the reason that we end up with different levels of digit formation or different levels of a phenotype being formed is really unclear in a lot of cases, but it could be due to the environment. So there could be some environmental factor in utero that causes fingers to form more readily in some cases than in others. Also likely is that there are additional genes that play a role in finger development. You guys don't have to take developmental biology, but there's also well, probably learn about gene modifiers and stuff in um, yeah, and so again, you can look at a pedigree. We can see individuals who are shown in white here are normal, shaded, have minor abnormalities, and black have definite abnormalities. Those are unknown sex, so probably early miscarriages or stillborns or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, so here we have, and I, this is actually for a disease, I believe, which is why some of these people are dead. But, um, these individuals would have like, what? <laughs> it's um, so these individuals would have, if we're thinking about polydactyly, like 
very small or underdeveloped digits, whereas these individuals that are all shaded in black would um, have really an excessive number of fingers. I don't know, I did not read down what this particular category is from. All right. Questions? Okay, so we have other cases, and I actually gave an example of this when I was talking about um, Hardy Wine, Hardy Weinberg, mm -hmm. chi square, and when we might see variations in chi square. Right? I gave an example with the Manx cat. That would be what we're looking at here. Um, so when we have an alethal, a lethal allele, it means that when we end up usually with two copies of that allele, there is too much of a protein or there is some developmental abnormality and individuals with that genotype don't survive. Okay, so here's just an example of um, yellow and non-yellow mice where if we start with two heterozygous individuals in the F1 generation we end up with yellow mice and non-yellow mice and the ratio when we look at it ends up being basically two to one. For every two yellow mice, we get one white mouse. But we don't, we're missing these individuals. Because these individuals die before birth, or die before they can reproduce. Okay, so here's our Manx cat. Everybody remember our Manx kitties? That's excellent. All right, so with our Manx kitties, um, the reason that they have no tail is because that dominant allele actually causes spine shortening. This kid, cat's spine actually extends into its tail. Okay, so if it has no tail, there's something going on with development of the spine itself. In individuals who are heterozygote, again, they get enough of the spine formation to be alive. They do have a phenotypic difference. They have no tail. But when we get two of the big M or the dominant alleles, the spine actually doesn't form properly. And so because it doesn't form properly, the spinal cord is very important, right? Because it also is our spinal cord. Um, so when that happens, those individuals don't survive. And we don't ever actually see them because they're not even born the early spontaneous abortions during pregnancy, and we never even know. We end up with two to one in terms of manx to non-manx, and that's the ratio that we have to work on. So if, if we never see it, how do we know that it occurs? Because we can genotype these individuals and see that we don't have any homozygous dominant. And also, um, because fertilization actually occurs, you can watch those fertilized embryos at, throughout their development and then see that at a point they go no further and die as an embryo. All right. Oh, here's my ABO stuff. Okay. <laughs> there are antigens, there are little flags. Yeah. So you can see. Um, here is an A antigen, and what makes it an A antigen is this group right here. On the B antigen, everything looks the same except for this group. So that's the only difference between A and B. It makes a huge phenotypic difference because somebody who has A blood cannot receive B blood as a donation or can't give blood to a B person. Um, and here, the individual has both the A and the B antigen. When we look at O, when we say that there are no antigens, what we mean is there are no distinguishable antigens or antigens that make a difference. It simply has no group on the end here. Okay. Positive and negative uh, are also antigens, but they are completely independent of ADO. They're called rhesus antigens. Rhesus, because they were first identified in rhesus monkeys. So here's the problem if um, why the phenotypes or antigens make such a big deal.
why it's so important. Uh, if you give somebody with type A blood a type B donation, their blood gets chunky. Right, so all of the red blood cells form these groups, these clumps, clusters. It's called agglutination, and this does not move through your blood vessels very smoothly, which means that you're not carrying oxygen around your body so well. Lucky for us, blood typing has come a long way. They don't just guess anymore, just stab you with somebody. Let's hope you're, let's hope you're a match. That's what they used to do when they did Back in the day when they used to like burn your throat when you had a sore throat and things like that. Yeah, they would also just randomly give you somebody's blood and like, oh, well, the spirits were fortunate, you were fortunate, you didn't die. <laughs> we guessed right. Okay. Um, yes. So just quickly, I have mentioned now that we do have uh, interactions between genes. Right, so I mentioned that when I was talking about expressivity and why. Some people fully express traits, but others don't. Sometimes it has to do with how many genes actually control a particular phenotype and how those genes interact with each other. So sometimes we have multiple genes that cause a particular phenotype to occur. This is one of my personal pet peeves in life, is that there is not a single allele that determines eye color. Right? So people always say, well, both my parents had blue eyes and I have green eyes. That can't happen because blue eyes are recessive. Yes, blue eyes are recessive, but at multiple loci. So you can get different combinations of your mom and dad and end up with. Another one of my parents had brown eyes and here we are, brown eyes. Okay. So this, this is a fallacy. Tell all your friends. Okay, um, so here is looking at stuff. Um, we're going to be talking about what we call epistasis. Uh, and so epistasis is going to be a, a situation in which one gene can phenotypically mask another gene's trait. So this is just of a quick example to get us started. We start off with a red pepper and a cream colored pepper as our parental generations, both are true breeding. When we cross them, we end up with a red pepper. So looking at the genotypes of the parents and the genotype of the F1, what do you notice about them? Okay, so red is dominant. Normally, if we were talking about one trait, how many genotypes would you get? How many letters? One letter. You would expect one letter combination, right? So you may expect YY and YY, but you wouldn't necessarily expect YYCC and YYCC. Everybody see what I'm saying? <laughs> okay, so in the F1, we see red, which is what we would expect. When we do the cross of two F1 individuals, this is our F2. All right, so these ratios, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Does that look like a monohybrid cross? We're only dealing with one trait. No. Because this trait is controlled by multiple genes, we end up with a dihybrid outcome. Right, where we have 9 red, that's our dominant, 3 peach, three orange, and one cream. Okay. All right, so this is an example of epistasis. When we see epistasis, what we're actually looking at are multiple genes that cause proteins, or that produce proteins, those proteins work together to produce a phenotype. So in this case, if you go back, if an individual has both big Y and big C, or wild type Y and wild type C, they get the red color. Those two produce enough protein from each of those genes to make a red individual. Here, if you have a wild type Y, but recessive C, 
this Y gives you an orange color, okay, because we're missing the other component from our wild type C. Here, if we have a wild type C but recessive Ys, we get an orange coloration, okay, because that's sort of what the C contributes. And then here, when we have two recessives, we don't get any of that coloration. Okay. So if you put orange with peach, the two proteins together give us a red color. All right, so to be clear, um, we can still use Mendel, but in this case, we're using Mendel basically to look at two traits or two genes with two alleles each. And so let's look at an example. All right, so we're going to walk through this example. Yes. Uh, okay, so we have two genes that code for hair coloration. In this case, we have the A allele, which uh, is a goody coloration, and then C is actually going to give us a black coloration. Big C, wild type C. Here are sort of the breakdowns of our genotypes. So if we have little a, little a, so we have two little a, it's going to be a black individual all the way. If we have a big C allele that allows us to have any pigmentation, if you have little c, little c, you're going to be an albino. Okay. So. <laughs> So we can basically be A, C, A, C, C, A, A, C, C, or A, C, These are sort of our potential outcomes, right? Our four phenotypic classes. In order for any individual to have pigmentation in their hair, whether it's a goody or black, they have to have at least one big C allele. Okay, so this individual has two little C alleles. Automatically, anybody who's this, yeah, anybody who is this genotype is going to be albino. Can't talk and write. It's really my problem. All right. What about these guys? These individuals will also be albino. In order, think about like if you're dying hair, in order for that hair to pick up any dye at all, you have to have one big C allele. All right, so even though we have a big A allele for goody coloration, this hair isn't willing to pick up that coloration because it has these little C alleles. All right, so here we have a big C allele, but we have two little A alleles. So what color would those individuals be? Yep, so these guys would be black. And here we have a big C and big A, so what would these guys be? Yep, so they would be a goody. Okay. All right, so we are about out of time, but I'm going to give you homework. I'm going to make you do the dihybrid cross for these two individuals. And I want you to come back and give me our phenotypic ratios in the F1. How many are going to be albino? How many are going to be black? How many are going to be a movie? Okay. These are our parents. So we have a parent that looks like this, and a parent that looks like this. They're true breeding, so they would actually be this and this. Black parent is this. White parent is no. That wrong. There we go. Black parent is this. White parent is that. Here's our F1. Cross those two. Do the dihybrid cross. Come back on Wednesday with numbers. How many are who's or what? Ah, oh, I thought I took it out. Yeah. Oh. All right, we'll do it anyways. Do it anyways.